Welcome back to another episode of The Junction. Today, we are going to be talking about, is there a place for AI in sales? So we're unpacking various different industries, how people and departments are using these AI tools, and not just AI, automation in sure. general, right? Um, so today, we're going to explore the benefits, challenges, and even just maybe dive into some ethical considerations of integrating AI into the sales process. So... Um, let's just jump into it, Chase. I mean, you started, you started here at Ben in sales or was it a more of a technical capacity? Was Scott selling the work and you were, he sold the work. I did the work and then we just circle back around and we do it over and over again. It was great. Then he got tired of selling. Uh, Maybe that's not the best way to say that. Like he enjoyed interacting with people. Sure. Scott's a relationship guy. Um, and I tend to be sometimes, um, But when you build the things that you end up selling, it becomes really easy to sell. So naturally, I started selling what Scott was selling, and it ended up working out really great. And you were a team of two at the time. Team of two. We've grown a lot since then. Man, man, mano y mano, and now we're at 26 or 27 or 28, I forget. We're in the 20s. Yeah. Yeah, so it's working out really well. So as we've evolved as an organization, obviously sales is is really, I hate to say it because I said marketing, sales is king, right? Because if we're not selling any work, we're not making any money, we're not delivering any work. Yeah. So obviously that function has evolved a lot. And as a company that focuses on integrating technology and automation to help people do more faster, um, what has that evolution looked like for us? What automation have we built into our sales process? And then let's maybe look at how we're exploring what AI yeah. layered on top of that automation can yeah. do for, for sales teams, small and large. One of the things that I've found is that from an automation perspective, at least, like sales guys are the least detailed people in the room. They're not going to fill out that required field. And if they are forced to fill it out, they're going to fill it out with what they think they know. And sometimes you don't. And that's a fair um, that's a fair ask, right? Like, I don't know, so I'll, but you're requiring me to fill it out. Well, a lot of that data we want from a closed loss perspective, right? Or why did we win this deal? Why did we win that deal over this deal? Or why was this deal much smaller? Like a lot of those things we're gathering from insights that we're importing or putting in manually by hand um, on on that record, on that account, on that contact, on that opportunity. And when you ask a non-detailed oriented person to do that over and over again, they're naturally, I mean, if you make it required, they can't skip it, right? So they're going to naturally put in stuff that maybe they're not going to dig into. Or maybe well, they I also want to give the, right the, the, there might be the, someone who could live in the details, but their pipeline is so big. Oh, for right? sure. They've got tons of deals. Oh, absolutely. And they're working with various prospects in different parts of the phone, different timelines, right? You you might be talking to someone yeah. that's six months out. So you're going to focus your efforts on someone who's raring to go, ready yeah. to sign uh, yeah. that SOW tomorrow. Oh, for sure. And I, I swear there's like a law for this. There's like when you throw an unlimited amount of something into a variable, into a mathematic problem, there's a theorem for something like this. But if you give somebody a million opportunities, right, like they're going to miss something. And where you want them to focus on is on the most important things. So those are the fields that we make required. And where automation plays into this is, well, if I can figure out the industry automatically, right, or their revenue automatically, let me automatically go get those things so that person doesn't have to fill them out. Not to mention if they're filling them out, then... They, we risk having some duplicate or uh, subjective. It's subjective, right? Like, oh, this is kind of nonprofit, but it, they do a little bit of SaaS. It's subjective and or they misspell something or it's in a, especially right. if you've got free form. Oh, absolutely. Good night. Those free oh. form fills. I, I lost all of those spelling bees and the only time I won was when I uh, took a peek at the answer sheet. So. You know what? We were talking about where I was from before we started recording this episode. Oh, yeah. Federal Washington, shout yeah. out. Um, yeah. I actually did have a time where I was on the stage as a spelling bee champion. Wow. Third grade. Mel Bell. Sherwood Forest. 
Yeah. Wow, <laughs> check you out. Yeah. However, I, I am not a fan of the, fr- still, right? Like I, <laughs> I can go up against the best of them on spelling, but if we can maybe do it better with a pick list or oh, a multi-select. You know, and it's not so much that somebody would type it wrong. <clears throat> it's that they would get it wrong naturally. Like, well, I picked the wrong one or they didn't know or they misunderstood. Um, and so if we can go back to a source that is uh, a truth on the matter or it's the same, like they have the same um, way of thinking about it every time, right? Well, now would they pick that for a reason. They might, they might be a nonprofit, but they might also be SaaS. Well, that company is going to delineate. And these are the Rolodexes, right? The, the Zoom Infos, the Apollos, all of those, right? Constant contact. Even, you know, we use HubSpot. Even HubSpot, to an extent, has some sort of database that they're pre-populating right. some of these fields. Whether right. or not you are overriding them with another, like, data provider. Yeah. But, yeah. Well, shout out to Apollo because their API is great. And they have uh, great insight into these companies. But for the most part, and I feel for a lot of them, like things change, right? You're a $10 million company today, but tomorrow I just closed a $5 million deal and now we're a $15 million company, you know? And some of those are just inherent challenges and you have to deal, as far as automation goes, you have to deal with that. Are you speaking to the data integrity? Yeah, data integrity, right? Like you, if you want to go back and have insights into the data from last year, well, that was last year. Gotcha. Right. Yep. They either grew or they died. They probably didn't stay the same. So taking it back to the sales process and at least how we've run it and grown and evolved with our automation. So before we even get down the road to what AI can help us do, um, where do you think, whether we're talking about then or the clients that we work with, where are those key moments that automation can take that salesperson from good to great because you have eliminated the manual data entry Mm -hmm. or the search function that now these tools are? Yeah. I mean, think about it this way. The more context you have, right, the more likely you're going to make better decisions. You're going to ask better questions. One thing that really has stand out even among some of the things that we're doing, Mel, internally is, well, what systems are they using, right? From an integration perspective, well, they're using Intact, not NetSuite. So if I come into the phone call and say, man, hope y'all love NetSuite, they're going to be like, uh, you know, that's really awkward because we're on Net- Intact, you know? Having that insight and that context on the front end gives you a lot of, like, mm, uh, not, not necessarily expertise, but you come in knowing who you're talking about goes back to that recruiting front. Like if you call out like, Hey, I saw you did some time at uh, Capgemini and t- saw you worked at Tesla, man, how was that? You know, that's just like that. Hey, they know who we are. They know what we use. Like, hold on. How did they know that we use Intact again? You know, like sure. they know about us. Um, and when you provide that context to a salesperson, like they're going to utilize that it's instant connection material. Yeah. So to kind of paint a picture for those listening, a very basic example, a lead comes in through the website and we take it in through HubSpot. We kick it back into Slack so that our sales team can see first name, last name, company. We can pull in really any field, any property that we want. So talk about like if we if we enrich the company um, data with some, you know, technographic information from Apollo, yeah. we want to pull that in. Obviously, we can see where they came from, the last page that they visited, all of that within Slack. And that's not even, I mean, that's just out-of-the-box integration, right, between HubSpot and Slack. I can just tell it what fields I want to send so that y'all are a little bit more informed. And when the salesperson goes and picks up the lead, to your point, they can now click out into a LinkedIn profile or we can pull that information all right into Slack. Yeah. It's, It's all about the context and giving the individual an opportunity to make a connection, right? We talked about relationships. If if I can relate to you on an individual level with something that you've done in the past or something that you've done or you want to do, now we have something to connect about. You know, people want to work with or be around individuals that look, have done, do the same things as they do. And if we can connect about kayaks or automation or I don't know softball like I know you e-bike do you kayak 
no. I, well, I mean, it maybe like one time, you know. You don't like own a kayak. You're no. not like an avid kayaker no, no. weekends. Okay. I, that's exercise, you know, like a, a keyboard. I'm <laughs> You're a keyboard waiting for, for that to be automated. Yes. Uh, let yeah. me know when that happens. Um, but when you provide that context, right, that ability to connect – and you do it in an automated fashion, like that sales guy just now is one step closer to making that connection and avoiding that awkward silence of like, hey, are you, where, where are you from? Oh, okay, you're from Canada. I've never been there. Uh, okay, uh, okay, where did you grow up? Yeah, Victoria. Wh- where is that again? You know, like there's, it, if you don't have any kind of way to connect and you're not really good at connecting or finding those connections, it makes that relationship much harder to build. And you've got maybe two minutes at the front end of a phone call to like make that quick connection and then pull that in to other topics of discussion as you're talking about business. Right. Well, not to mention, we also automate the outreach to an extent, right? So if someone comes through, we're kicking out an email to them with that rep's calendar. And if they book, we have some parameters around it. You can't book like 30 minutes from receiving the email, but you know, that if if that rep is back to back or in their own calls and they're coming up against that meeting, oh wow, someone booked on my calendar for this afternoon. Again, servicing that information within Slack. Absolutely. Where we live. Um, that that only helps. So so some of this stuff I, I think we or we've been talking about the front end and building that relationship quickly, um, having some of those insights. But what about when we get past that, you know, we're, we're moving them through the pipeline. We're demoing. Now we've moved to close one or close loss, the insights piece of it. We were yeah. just talking about it before the recording and how even today we're doing some analysis on our own, uh, data in Salesforce and look running reports. And wouldn't it be great if we had the ability to ask a tool? Yeah. Hey, yeah. what we're in Q3 of 2022, what, were, what yeah. was our, you know, best-selling service or integration, pre-built integration yeah. um, by rep, by... I mean, there's so many things that if we had the ability to mine our data in that way, and I know there's tools out there, like we talked about mm-hmm. Tableau, I think was one mm-hmm. of them, um, but these AI tools are uh, changing the conversation around that and how quickly we'd be able to go find that information. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to have to give a shout out to the company you're referencing to. It's Ask Edith, young startup. They've got uh, quite a bit going on. But what they have done is mastered the large language model to interpret a natural, um, they've interpreted a natural prompt into SQL. So SQL is a way to, uh, or it's a database, right? And you can run a SQL query to query the data that you need. And this is all happening in the background. So you ask, you ask a natural question, how many opportunities did I close in 2022? It will then generate the correct query, the code almost, if you will, to grab the correct data. It will then deliver the data in a table and paint paint a picture in a graph. Without you having to go into your CRM. Oh, it's, and ma- it's magical. build a report. Yeah, and you think about... From a, how cool, I'm going to quote air quotes here, traditional, like you go into Salesforce, you have to think, well, okay, it's opportunities right now. I got to pick the right fields. I got to pick the right filters. And 30 minutes later, you finally kind of whipped out. With Ask Edith, they are taking the natural uh, question, translating all of that. And within, I don't know, call it a minute, right? They're delivering the results that you're looking for uh, and painting that graph for you automatically. <laughs> Okay, so we're a Salesforce shop. We've been a Salesforce partner for a long time. And we implement it, customize it, automate it. Yeah. We've got folks, some really, really smart people here that do this all day long. You can't can't be telling me though that Salesforce is not investing in in AI, right? Like how to what extent are we um we've talked about this before. Before we go build it. And before we go start connecting apps and using OpenAI, yeah. we don't want to replicate functionality that all of a sudden Salesforce or HubSpot's going to roll out. Oh, absolutely. Are you? What do you know about Salesforce and what they're doing with AI? It's 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 funny that you are bringing this up during our recording session because I literally have one of the pages pulled up from one of our team members who talked about this and Salesforce is is uh, quickly iterating on the GPT large language model to uh, 
pull it out and deliver functionality across all of their products. And so it's it's only a matter of time before they perfect it and make it really good and deliver something like Ask Edith. Mm -hmm. Maybe the core difference there is they're going to charge a whole lot more than maybe Ask Edith will. Um, you have to use Salesforce, obviously, if you're going to be wanting to use those things. The other challenge that a Salesforce is going to run into is that people are going to want to look across multiple databases, right? So a lot of our organizations, including us, we use HubSpot, Salesforce, Intact. Maybe they're using Stripe. Maybe they've got, you know, 70 of the other tools that a lot of these studies are saying that everybody's using, you know, X amount. 242. Yeah, a lot. I mean, that that's what we learned at Inbound. I was at Inbound last year was, um, you know, the CEO, CEO got up and said, hey, the average scaling company has 242 SaaS apps. A lot. I mean, really, and, and we, you know, I, I think we do a fairly decent job of kind of auditing our tech stack just from a, that's a good practice for any business, especially growing and scaling. You want to understand like right. user count, you can understand which licenses aren't being used, but I think that that blew everyone's mind. And even today when we, we continue to kind of leverage that stat out there. And I'm sure it's changed Yeah, even since then. Well, I mean, you, Salesforce is the 900-pound gorilla, the, the billion-dollar company that a lot of people have never heard of. Um, and unless you build your entire business on on Salesforce, like they're going to come out with these capabilities. But it's really, for the, for the average size company, they're only going to be able to look at their Salesforce data. I'm sure they'll come out with functionality that allows them to connect to more things, but it will be prohibitively, prohibitively expensive, right? And that's why companies like Tableau and Microsoft BI and all these different BI companies are uh, proliferating because they can look across all of these different databases. Well, Ask Edith can do the same thing, but all you have to do is type a question, right? Like when I, when I think about running reports in Salesforce, I'm like, well, I have to have the exact data I need to know the exact filters, right? And I need to talk to that in person and what their expectations are because otherwise I'm going to miss it. I'm going to deliver something that they're not. Oh, you just you just barely missed it. Yeah. I know I've run into the same thing building custom reports in HubSpot where it's a lot of trial and error um, trying to figure out oh, yeah. exactly. I know, yeah. the, I know what I want to find or the question, but, <laughs> but it's just like pulling in the right properties and make on. sure you're slicing it the right way and you have the right filters. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's what that's what is really cool in some of the demos that I've seen, and we're we're starting to figure out what this partnership might look like. But it, they're you're they're utilizing this this large language model to quickly interpret. Okay, I've got this set of data and these set of fields, and of that, I to answer this question, I need you know column one, three, and five, and boom, here's the answer. Right, right for the average person, that's going to take thirty minutes to figure out. I mean, I think this this is going to help our sales teams, right? I don't think we're replacing people oh. with these bots anytime soon. Absolutely not. At least not on our side. That's not that's not Ben's strategy. Um, we're certainly not going to replace our sales team with uh, any of these AI. I don't know. Is it, are they bots? Robots? Um, I mean, it depends on how you think about it, right? Like, I would think about it as a bot if you're going to chat with it. But if it's preemptively providing me answers, then it's 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 advanced analytics. Sure. All right. So let's jump into what is in the headlines. Headline number one, sales industries always be closing mantra could get boost from AI. I mean, I think that's just attention grabbing. Everybody oh, likes yeah. to say that. Always be closing. You gotta you gotta click the link, right, to get the ad revenue. Yeah. You know, I'm I'm actually gonna revert this back to you because you can't close unless you get a lead. How do you think AI is gonna pump up that lead funnel at the beginning because if if we're being totally honest I can't close a deal unless we have a lead in the door and the lead in the door only comes from the marketing front so how is AI going to help me close something by getting more leads in the door yeah well I think some of these tools especially if we are able to go implement them let's mine our data quickly let's understand exactly where our leads are coming from and double down this is an exercise that market marketers do today uh, have done historically manually, right? You're going into your various databases. Usually it's a CRM and hopefully the lead source is filled out. If if at one point in time, because at one point in time, uh, in previous roles that you're relying on that salesperson to tell Salesforce that that account and that contact came from a trade show. Remember all the trade shows they go to. Did you put the lead in? 
Did you upload the list? I mean, th- these are the types of things that as we continue to mature our marketing muscle, right, and understanding exactly how we bring leads in, um, because historically we've been, and still today, sh- our strong referral base, um, but still trying to understand how to reach those people that maybe aren't, you know, finding us via the referral networks. So I would use it to first mine the data we have. Mm. We're getting, by asking it, of each of our segments, you know, where are, what's our strongest perform? Where where are we getting the most organic search leads? What pages are they looking at? We can do some of this in HubSpot, right? Right. And we can go build some reports in Salesforce. Um, But I would start there by quickly asking those questions. Yeah. And then, of course, we would go, how do we reach them? We're going to generate more content. I'm not going to go to ChatGPT and ask it to write me, you know, 15 blogs on Stripe and Intact integrations. No, I'm going to go interview our subject matter experts here. After doing a little bit of research, I might ask it, hey, what are, what are people searching on? What, you know, what are Stripe users? How are they, what's the biggest functionality? I don't know. You might do some preliminary research on using ChatGPT. But then I'm going to go do some internal analysis, do some interviews, maybe talk to some clients that are using it. Um, that it's been deployed, and then I'm going to pump those transcripts into OpenAI, yeah. into our own box. That's what we're using, right? Right. And then I'm going to go create content. And that that right there, it's a volume game because that's mm. where, that's where, and I'm kind of jumping ahead because we're not talking about marketing yet. But when you ask me how am I going to deliver more leads, my challenge is always velocity, volume, And then the variation of it. And Mm -hmm. so how am I going to do that quicker? Being able to get those pieces out faster. And you've heard me say it, big fan of utilizing your own transcripts for this stuff. So it exists today. Go take your case studies and your blog content now and go pump it in there and then figure out how to optimize it or, or iterate on it. And I think that will, we've seen content bring more leads in the door yeah. for our business. Yeah. So that's how I would start just kind of like scratching the surface yeah. of it. I have a question, but the next headline really kind of pushes into this question. It's from government technology. Marketing professor uses AI to coach sales professionals, right? So this idea is we use AI to teach sales professionals how to deliver better emails, documents, you know, so on and so forth. I mean, I want to take it a step further, though. I'm thinking about HubSpot, right, and these drip emails, the sequences that run. Uh, maybe you're using Salesforce, uh, Marketing Cloud, Marketo, one of those technologies, right, to do some level of drip campaigns. Maybe it's the sequences where the, the sales rep has predetermined um, some level of, like, kind of drip campaign that is specific to him or her to that prospect. And you were talking about variation. What if... What if the AI took what the salesperson wrote and had A, B, and C, and it automatically generated variations of the content without? I'm, I'm gonna, in this scenario. I'm going to go without oversight, okay. right? And it is self-testing variations of the email to get more clicks, to you know, to get higher click-through rates, whatever that ends up being. Where are you on that? Is that is that a good thing? I hate it. I love it. Let's do it. Should we Where go code it right now? Where do I sign? No, I I, I think it's a great, I, I mean, I'd be lying if I said I haven't been experimenting with some of the features around rewriting uh, for tone, right? So I think if, as long as, I mean, I mean, look, we've got emails that I've partnered with sales to write. Yeah. You know, hey, I'm Mike. I got your inquiry from the website. You're looking for this integration where book do, time. Where do I sign? Right. Like some of these things are, and, and it's, we're converting, we're yep. getting meetings booked, right? Yep. If they raise their hand, we don't need to, to oversell in that first email, that first touch. Now, if you're talking about lose it, like, you know, someone goes radio silent, this happens. We kind of call that lead right. going into purgatory, yeah. so to speak. Um, I do think that I've heard marketers last week, I was on a webinar, uh, marketers talking about how, hey, my third touch was not, it was just falling flat. First, second, you know, killing it. Third, not so much. 
they put that marketer put in all four touches and asked ChatGPT, why is this not working? It recommended a rewrite and her clicks went up, her opens went up. Really? Yeah. Interesting. Uh, yeah, I connected with her on LinkedIn because I was like, oh, that's cool. Yeah, I was like, I need to, I need to learn again. I think in general, we're doing this podcast because people have said we want to know more about AI. We want to know more too, right? right? Let's open up the conversation. Let's get people talking about it. Right. Um, so anyway, that's one example that yeah. I've not personally deployed. I just, I mean, just came off that webinar last week, right. but I'd love to take our existing uh, drips and do the same thing yeah. to, to better understand that. You know what's really cool about this time in history? And it, I'm going to go back to my gaming days. Like when a new game came out, you wanted to be not the first to play because it just came out. You wanted to be the first to play because nobody else had any insight on how to get to level 50, right? Or to my husband's still like this to oh, be yeah. clear. Oh, totally. I mean the new Zelda oh, right now, he's yeah. all over it. Yeah, yeah. Like there's no like cheat guide. There's nobody knows how to do it. And we are in that moment in time in history where nobody in the business world has like, Oh yeah, you got to do this. And right. Here's the master guide. And for 90 grand a week, you know, we'll tell you how to do it. Like, Everybody is on the same page. And that's what I love about this particular moment in history because everybody's trying to figure out, well, what if you did this? Or what if you did that? You know, and like, oh, check this out. And I really love this moment in time. It'll be something that I look back, you know, on when I'm retired, if I ever get to retire. That, you will. That people were like, that was that one moment in history where it wasn't passed down, right? It was brand new. Right. Nobody knew what they were doing. I do think... This is a perfect time to plug. So we talk about use. We try to get down to like, what is a use case that you as a person listening to this podcast can take away today? Right. So if you're a sales professional listening to this, don't sleep on rewriting the emails. I have seen your emails, friends. Okay. <laughs> Literally. Literally. And I appreciate your passion. Okay. But sometimes we don't use complete sentences and, mm. you know, I mean, that punctuation, you know, that's, that's yeah. like, it's like at bare minimum. One on one. Yeah. Go right, you know, you and I actually, we've gone back and forth on Slack. You've had some prospects that you're trying to get, you know, some activity out of. Yeah. And talking through different approaches and we're screen sharing and you're, you're pulling up chat GPT. Yeah. And you're asking it, what, what Not about ashamed. this? ashamed. Yeah. Here's what I'm trying to do. I want, I want to create some sense of urgency. Yeah. Here's my deadline when I'd like for this to, to close or to make yeah. a movement. I want to get them to do this action. Can you write it in a friendly, authentic way? Yeah. That's a huge starting point versus yeah. sitting down and writing that from scratch. So if you're listening today and you're in sales, uh, like I said, don't sleep on, you know, taking, I, I know how long it takes to write content and emails, especially if you're trying to solicit an action, a call to action. I think that that is a perfectly good use case to get your feet wet if you're not using it. Absolutely. I'll tack on to that. Don't be afraid to iterate too, you know, like from a, from a manager to your direct report, it's, it's difficult to be like, eh, that, that missed the mark just a little bit. Cause you don't want to be chintzy, right? Like, yeah, that was good enough. That's fine. But with these large language models, they don't, they don't care. Like just be open and be like, I really just let's revise that and replace this word with this. Or can I say I found myself being overly polite to Chat GPT? Am I the only one? Please, please write this for me. Like, I al I also actually want to thank it, and I don't know if there's a good way. Like like I found myself interacting with it as though yeah. it was a person, and that's just in my like oh, that naturally. I would say yeah, they're providing 100%. me this intense response in two seconds, and yeah. I'm like, thank you so much. Yeah can we just maybe tweak this thing? And you're right. You can just tell it, make it. Yeah. Make it witty. I, you know, I, I've heard and seen in different articles that we should be polite to these bots because they will train on that and they will then naturally be polite back. Um, I don't know which way that's going to go. You know, it's like, it, should I thank it for doing something that it was designed to do and it A, doesn't really care and B, you know, it's actually it's actually costing you more money uh, to uh, write thank you because it with the context, right? These tokens that it's digesting that it literally costs you more money to say thank you. Period. Correct. Yeah. But at the same time, you know, all of, all of this, it's, it's like emulating a human. So you're naturally inclined to be like, 
hey, thank you so much for helping me. Would you please change this just a hair, you know, and like there's yeah. this natural inclination. And to meanwhile, not be you're like, now I'm never going to forget that when I'm messing around with you. Right. We're getting charged tokens because yeah. we're using that open yeah. API. Yeah. Okay. Well, fair enough. I don't think it hurts to be polite, but hey, we'll uh, keep keep the tokens in mind. All right. Let's move on. We've got, uh, we've talked through our headlines. Let's do a hot take. These are always fun. How does AI add value to sales intelligence? I guess we've kind of been talking about this. Yeah. We kind of let off with that, right? Yeah. I feel like I feel like this is one of those areas where people have already been doing this. Salesforce has Einstein. HubSpot has multiple scores that you can look at. What what is being left behind here is that how do how do I do this for, you know, use cases that are not like top of mind. You know, Salesforce has opportunity scoring. It's like Okay, well, it's 90. What what does that mean again? You know, like for the average AE that's just stepping in, okay, it's great, 90. You know, is that an A? Does that mean they're going to close? Where I think this really will play into is providing intelligence to answer questions that people naturally have, like, hey, how did that call go? Uh, I don't know. It went pretty well, right? But I this was my first call, so I have no idea, you know. But where we have these transcripts and we can look into that and we can do the sentiment analysis, right? We can look at the activity and we can answer these questions that people naturally have that they're answering to their direct reports or vice versa. We're going to have that intelligence level to be able to call out these really unique things. And ultimately, that's going to make you more productive because you can either close lose this opportunity really fast because you didn't have, you know, one of the... I'm stepping back. One of the questions you can ask is, did it sound like we had the decision maker on the phone? Mm. Well, the chat GPT doesn't really know, but it can tell based on sentiment that this person was really nervous about making decisions, right? Somebody that's the decision maker is not going to be nervous about making a decision for the most part. Um, So there are, there are questions that we naturally ask in our head or our bosses ask of us, right? And those are the areas where we should be focused on. You know, it's all of those sales questions on like, was well, this going to close this month? Is it going to close next quarter? When, when is this going to close, Mel? And that's like everybody asks that question because everybody wants to know what the number is going to be. And you don't know until it's too late. Yeah. Am I on pace? the year two or like there's probably like quota things too i know there's reports and dashboards that you can build out but just questions you were talking about this um like uh the percent to close Mm. right like how many do we close when versus close loss push rate by yes thank you that's what i was talking about yeah close rate by sales rep by quarter you know maybe they're having a great year and they're more likely to close well that should influence our forecast or our predictability that's more of mm, just maybe slight calculation, but we can utilize that to pair people up like, hey, these two guys sell the same things, right? Let's use some AI to determine, well, who's going to be better, right? Or we can do some natural investigation of the data to determine and predict things that we weren't otherwise going to be able to do without this level of intelligence. Yeah. All right. I think that wraps us up for time today, but I am still super curious about how other people are using this in a sales function. So if you're a sales professional out there, please send us an email. It's okay if you use ChatGPT to write it. Um, Super interested in all the ways that you are either using it, thinking about using it. Maybe your your organization is already rolling it out. Um, I know there's lots of tools out there too that we haven't even scratched the surface on. So shoot us an email at thejunction at bentechnology.com and uh, we'll catch you all next time. Ciao.